Good morning. Um, we were out quite late last night, and there's nothing to wake you up in the morning session like a 12-year-old photo of you uh, in the previous presenter's uh, slides <laughs> to make you wake up. <laughs> um, so in, in many respects, this talk is also a bit of a journey down memory lane for me, because um, as Michael's talk uh, indicated, we've been you know, we, we started working on using SVG and interactive uh, graphics techniques um, over a decade ago um, for various purposes. Um, and one of the interesting things with both Michael and myself is that neither of us are, I don't think we have ever called ourselves programmers uh, in terms of uh, a job description or a, a kind of career. But programming is clearly one of those things that we've used as a tool to help us explore ideas about how we want to do our job, which has involved the presentation of statistics. And one of the, the questions that we frequently get asked as we, we've been doing that work is, you know, how do we learn to program if we are not programmers? How do we learn to program graphics if we want interactive graphics, um, but we haven't up until this point um, you know, chosen that as a career. So I've got 550 slides here, <laughs> <laughs> which will take you to the Jason Davis entry level. For <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm also going to use this as a slightly cathartic session for me to explain away some of my, um, my indiscretions in my undergraduate career. Because I had a chance to develop programming prowess um, at an early age. Uh, this is my first um, entry-level course on computer programming and systems at Lancaster University, and I'm just going to try and guess the, the makeup of the audience here by asking if anybody can tell me what programming language we're looking at here. Turbo. Robert. Turbo. Yeah, 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 Turbo Pascal. And so I, I, I was a really... Uh, bright spark at university, I realized that computers might catch on uh, as, a <laughs> as a tool for, for what I might want to do for a career. So I signed up to a computer programming and systems course um, and found myself in front of a Turbo Pascal um, program. And I was underwhelmed, I have to say. I, I found it a little bit dull. <laughs> and that, not everyone reacts like that. Some people might look at this and think, great, Turbo Pascal, you know, how, how lovely. Um, two of the projects that we worked on in this first module were how to write a calculator and how to, to write an alarm clock. And I was amazed uh, that actually, after a couple of decades, it was still possible to go onto YouTube and find that people have made videos of how to program a calculator in Turbo Pascal. <laughs> so for the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to leave this <laughs> running for you. So <laughs> you can, I think, you know, there were other things catching my attention as an undergraduate, and this just didn't do it for me. And the interesting thing when I found this video is that the person who made this video must have been acutely aware that some people might find this boring. So what do you think the solution was? A soundtrack. <laughs> I've got it on mute at the moment. Do you want to hear the soundtrack? What does the soundtrack to coding sound like? Okay, enough. <laughs> Shall I keep the music going for the rest of the talk? Or are you? Okay, so uh, Pascal didn't do it for me. It was a nice try. I couldn't really see the relevance of it. I was a geography major. I was interested in cartography, B 
This is a couple of decades ago. GIS was just starting to emerge as a, as a kind of new thing, but um, I didn't see the relevance of this to what I wanted to do for a career. So, to my eternal shame, having passed the course with sufficient credit during the, the coursework, I left the final exam to go and see Costa Rica beat Scotland in the 1990 World Cup, and I forever am um, haunted by the fact that I didn't complete the course properly. So for the next decade after this, that represented my view of programming. Great for some people who I wouldn't necessarily want to drink with in the bar, um, but you know, not for me. But that all changed around about 10 years later because Michael already referred to Andreas Neumann's work with SVG when it was in its, its kind of frontier days. And it, this is about 2002. And this changed my idea about why programming would be a good thing to get involved in. Because what Andreas created here with this lovely interactive Choropleth map of Vienna was he was doing all of the stuff that were people who were bringing GIS online had failed to get. You know, a nice fluid user interface, um, something that was fun to play with, and crucially something that when you were designing and programming this kind of thing, that you could control how it looked and felt. And suddenly, going back to my interest in cartography and all the things I really wanted to do, this took on a whole new kind of light for me, and I revised my idea about why programming would be a good thing to do. And in fact, Andreas wrote a paper that explained why if you want to learn to program, programming graphics is a good way to get involved. And he said, Students are usually motivated if you can graphically visualize what they program. And I think that was one of my problems with Turbo Pascal, is it always seemed a little bit abstract to me. You know, and you certainly see people working on large computer programs, which become quite difficult to, to, to use as a learning aid. But SVG was quite different. The thing with SVG that's quite nice is that when you write a line of SVG code and you say, right, I'm going to create a circle, I'm going to call it a big blue circle, and I'm going to give it a couple of uh, attributes and a color. I mean, I'm interested. Does anybody know what I'm going to get when I reveal the next? <laughs> what, what is this going to display? Who knows that the fill represents the color of the circle, and it's expressed in hex code? A greenish kind of circle, absolutely. Now, one person in the auditorium might know before I showed it that it's going to be a green circle, but the lovely thing with SVG is you can see it's a bloody green circle when <laughs> and you wanted a blue circle, and so what you can then do is go back and say, well, actually, I've got a, now I can look up what the hex code for blue really is, and I'm going to make the radius bigger. There's my big blue circle. And so there's this lovely sort of immediate feedback to what you're writing, which you don't get in things like Turbo Pascal, certainly if you love um, the concept of working with visuals. But the only problem with this <laughs> is I can make two circles very easily. Big deal. This kind of popular internet meme shows you the resulting challenge. And for me, this is one of the problems, you know. Uh, and I'm pleased Lynn's here, because we've got an owl on screen. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> so this then represents the challenge. You've captured people's attention. Hey, we've got a visual environment for, for, for programming. That looks good. But then there's still this huge issue about how do I get from the basic to something that looks more complicated? Because everyone is seeing people do stuff. Um, and, and you want to make that jump. How does it work? Well. Again, I referred back to my experience of Turbo Pascal and that the alarm clock and the calculator didn't do it for me. Um, I guess it's because I think my suggestion would be when you take that entry point, focus on something that you're actually quite passionate about. Um, and as you would have seen from Michael's photo of me in my replica Portsmouth Football Club shirt, uh, my first ever interactive animated graphic was a football graph. Um, and this really is a, a trip down Amnesia Lane because um, what happened in 2002, 2003 season for my team, uh, Portsmouth, was sufficiently brilliant for me to decide to animate it in a little graph.
Brighton are the, the rivals down the road, which, which was you know, a nice little bit of context because at the end of the season, <laughs> they were relegated and, uh, and Pompey won the league. Um, and so there were two major revelations, two eureka moments from this. One was my team actually bloody won something. For the first time in goodness knows how long, it was something to celebrate. But I also realized that by having fun and working with a little bit of data that I was interested in, I produced something which introduced me to a lot of the fundamental concepts of programming. Certainly programming with graphics, you know, the idea of how do I animate something, how do I, make some, how do I read in some data, and I actually put a little bit of text down here to kind of re remind myself why this was working. And, and in Michael's talk, he mentioned the value of iteration. And I think that's the really important thing. It's, it's iterating, working with the DNA in your early graphics, carrying it forward as a kind of learning experience. So um, this kind of iteration worked very, very quickly from this point in. Um, and in fact, Michael looked at my graph, and he wasn't quite so passionate uh, about Portsmouth uh, as me. So he was, he was less amazed by this graphic than I was. Um, and he said, well, this is great, he said, but you've only got two bars. He said, build something bigger with more bars and we'll be interested. And I looked at this and then I looked at actually the data that I was paid to actually work with, the, the stuff that we produce at the statistics office. And I thought, well, is there anything that I can generate from this that would actually be useful for a, a wider group of people? So the next iteration um, in what we were doing was to take the football graph and turn it into this. <coughs> so this was our first ever animated population pyramid and essentially it's the DNA of the football graph. It does the same thing. It's a little animation, takes in some data, draws some bars. But we suddenly realized this was a bit of a eureka moment because this isn't a graphic in the normal sense of a graphic being a summary of some data. It's actually a visual representation of the underlying data. And we learned the fact that we could allow people to interrogate that underlying data. So we could use the, the visual to stimulate interest in the data. You know, what, what's going on here? These were people born in 1919. What would we have been celebrating in 1919 that made us make lots of babies? Um, these people here were born in 1946-47. So we were getting visual interfaces to the data that we were producing. And we realized we could do even more than that. We could use it to select multiple um, age bands um, and then animate it, just like the football graph. And now suddenly we're getting some really interesting interactions with the data going on. I'm looking at people aged under 16 dynamically calculating what proportion of the population that represents. Um, if we break out the animation, in 1971, that's 25% of the population of the UK was, was under 16. In 2004, it dropped to below 20%. So it was a really nice kind of tactile way of playing with the data set. So, so that's a, the, the, the kind of benefit of iteration to get from there to there. <coughs> um, and that works you know, quite well for us. We got a lot of good feedback. And it, it was that kind of project that generated the momentum inside the office to spend more time doing this sort of stuff. If I'd have just wandered around showing people football graphics, I probably would have got a reputation of a very different uh, kind uh, in the office. But again, even by releasing this, um, we started to think about, well, where might the next iteration take us? And it's exactly the same sort of process that Michael was talking about when he was talking about revising um, the Coropleth map. Um, we started to look at how users were interacting with this data and thinking about what kinds of extra information might we be able to, to yield um, based on, on further iteration. So the very latest version of this graphic is um, now programmed in D3, which makes our lives a lot easier. And you can spot the obvious difference here, is there's two of them. Because <laughs> we thought actually one of the interesting things that people wanted to do would be not to just look at the population structure of the country, 
but to be able to look at the population structure of different areas uh, within the country. So we can look at two different data sets at the same time, and I can use these, th this kind of drop-down list here to choose the areas that we're interested in. So we've got Winchester on the left-hand side. We'll, we'll, we've got Oxford selected on the right. Um, and what this graphic now allows us to do is the stuff that we thought originally um, would have been too difficult to implement or that we hadn't even thought of at all. So I'll explain some of those changes. The first thing is that we still have this, this kind of time slider concept, but what we've done is separate the pyramids into two components, the central fill and also the, the outlines, because the idea is that we might want to be able to lock the outlines and so that the, out, the, out, the outlines at the moment are fixed for the start of the animation, so it shows the population structure in 2001. And now as we animate, not only can we see the difference in the population structure between Winchester and Oxford, but we can also see how each population structure is changing over time compared to where it was. So that's a useful thing that we thought users would appreciate. We can switch between looking at the size of the population and the structure of the population. So now we're looking at the percentage of the population in each age band. So if you're comparing two areas of very different population sizes, um, this is a way of being able to, to look at the structures. Um, and we also thought, again, looking at some of the perceptual stuff that was going on, it's quite difficult to memorize the visualization on the left and superimpose it on the visualization on the right. So we can use some sort of gentle transitions to allow people to do that and then interact with the data in the same way that we did on the first one. So we can kind of tabulate and compare the differences between these population projections. So that is the benefit for me of, of moving in iterations through a kind of programming concept that will retain your interest and passion as you go through. And it doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy. I think the person who wrote Teach Yourself SVG in 24 hours should be shot <laughs> <laughs> because it raises false expectations about just how much you can learn in, 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 a, uh, in a day. Um, but what it does allow you to do um, is, is kind of take inspiration um, from elsewhere. Having assembled some skills that allow you to code, it then allows you to look at the world around you and to start to think how that might have an impact on other ideas and other products that you want to, to work with. So has anybody seen this? I think probably it's already been featured in the conference once or twice. It, it was really popular last year. I think it was the most popular item on the New York Times website, um, which was a, an interactive dialogue quiz. It was like a, a, f a pretty big quiz. I think it was about 25 questions, which is a, a big form for people to fill in online. Um, and when you went through uh, questions about, you know, which words rhyme with which words, what's your word for this, and so on, you ended up with a personal uh, dialect map of the places in the country uh, that were most similar to the way that you spoke. Funnily enough, I don't speak like any American, so my personal map looks very different to this. But there's some interesting stuff with this. Um, it's funny that on a news website, the most popular item wasn't a news story at all, you know, uh, which is a, an interesting kind of direction to take. And like I say, it was the most popular item on the website, but it was only launched on December the 21st, you know, so it was massively popular. And, and my kind of the contention for why it was popular is because it's visual. We think that's probably quite important. Um, but it's also personal. It's interesting to see how many times on the map the word you or your <laughs> is mentioned, it's framing it around the, the user, um, and it's social because we've got the ubiquitous buttons for people to then share their personal um, in, uh, information on Twitter and Facebook. So that was an, an inspiration to one project that we worked on, and another one that fed into the same project was this book. Has anybody read the Kahneman book on thinking fast, thinking slow? This um, was a really interesting thing for somebody working in a statistics office, because what Kahneman says is people aren't very good with statistics. They're not very good intuitive statisticians. People aren't, because heuristics and kind of, uh, kind of impressions of statistics based on personal intuitions are not very good. Um, and that was backed up by a survey that was carried out by Ipsos Mori in the UK um, last year, 
where they used this phrase emotional innumeracy. And they said people aren't very good with statistics, not because they're bad with numbers as such, their mathematical skills might be quite good, but that their own personal intuitions about statistics are too much governed by their own experiences and the, the information that they are exposed to in the media. And when you think about it, that's a potent cocktail because a lot of reporting in the media is reporting by exception rather than reporting the everyday. And so you could imagine how that might skew people's perceptions. And so they came up with this survey, which kind of underlined that. They did a, a, a survey of over 1,000 adults across the country, and they asked them some very simple questions based on uh, official statistics data. They said, for every 100 people in Britain, how many do you think are Muslim? I'm going to get you involved in this. Here's our 100 people. How many do you think the British public decided were Muslim? Three? No? It's interesting. I'm interested uh, because everyone, I think if we, even if we did a survey in this room, we would get some variation. What might surprise you is that great British public decided that 24 out of every 100 people in Britain were Muslim. Um, when the official statistics suggest that it's about five in every hundred. So it's fascinating for people to be out by that <laughs> kind of order with, with something that you think we, you know, we, we should be more aware of. This one was even more interesting for the fact that I asked this question in a, when I did a lecture in a, a girls' school. <laughs> and I said, what do you think the, the great British public think about for every hundred girls, and that's girls um, between 13 and uh, 16, I think. For every hundred girls under 16 in Britain, how many get pregnant each year? So here's our hundred girls. How many of them do you think the British public decided get? What, what did the British public think? <laughs> um, spot on. And the actual answer is, uh, you know, we'd have to have 200 girls for us to be able to colour in one, you know. Actually, in the girls' school, uh, people were outraged. The girls were, how dare the British public think that of us, you know. We're f <laughs> we are fine, upstanding uh, citizens. And it shows you how, actually, as soon as something becomes more personal to you, you, you kind of, you, that emotional element uh, definitely rises. So... I thought, wouldn't it be great to take all of those inputs, the fact that things like that New York Times dialogue quiz were, were so popular, this whole concept of people being bad with statistics, and then launch it uh, into this kind of, this emerging concept of gamification. I came to a conference here in Winchester last year, which was fascinating, because it was about gamification, visualization, and uh, text analysis, and it was really interesting to see the directions in which gamification were being taken, particularly for things like data collection, uh, which, which was interesting. Um, but we did something slightly different with it. Um, we built a quiz, um, and I'm going to show you the quiz. It's just a really simple quiz, which I asked users to put in their postcode. Now, I actually, you've been in Winchester for a couple of days, so I've got the Winchester postcode here for the university, and I'm going to test you. Um, the postcode for the university is SO224NR. And so what's happened is we're using some APIs to re, uh, retrieve some geographical data from our geography portal display it on a Google map, and then some statistical data from our census API to produce a personalized quiz at the small area level. Because I was interested in the national stuff, but the national aggregate's always quite a false concept. What we wanted to do is to narrow it down to a fairly small area on the ground around. So here we've got the university, and the first question is, for every 100 people, how many of them are under 16 in this part of the world? So give me a guess. 14, we'll go for 14. And so for each question, and this was the interesting part of the gamification, we decided rather than give you instant gratification of saying, here's the answer, we would animate the difference. And the further out you are, you have to suffer the indignity of, <laughs> <laughs> of waiting for a long time. For, 
for, for, for, the, for the quiz, the thing. Right, so that's interesting, because we, what we didn't want to do, again, we didn't want to prime people with information here. There, was a, there were some people saying, put the national average up. Say, this is the national average, what do you think it is in your area? And we wanted to kind of not build that way. We wanted to really try and anchor it to people's own intuitions. So the next question is quite an interesting one. So we know how many people are young. So what might that mean for what we think the median age is? What is the median age in uh, this part of the world? So we have a little slider here that allows us to, to drag a guess. So what do you think? 30. 32. And so again, the gamification element allows us to, to animate down. Where's it gonna settle? Uh, all right. <laughs> Okay, and so having got some simple stuff on demography out of the way, we started to get to stuff where it is quite interesting because this is stuff that's less visual. When, if you were going for a walk around Winchester, suddenly it's not that easy to know just by looking how many people own their own house that they're living in. You know? So for every 100 households, how many of them are owned by the occupier with a, with a mortgage? What do you think? 68, I like this. this is, these, are, these are quick fire answers. It's, You remember what I said about indignity, you know. <laughs> How low can you go? Okay, right. So, and in fact, this particular question foxed a lot of people in the same way. Everyone overestimating how many people owned the places that they live in. Um, then taking a cue um, from the Mori work, how many of the people are Christian in Winchester, in this part of Winchester? 47, and I have to say, this is, this is based on census, people telling us that they're Christian, not people ticking people off as they go into the, the church, but let's have a look. <laughs> 60, not bad, can you guess what the next question is? Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'd be surprised if it was more than 40, based on the previous <laughs> answer. <laughs> So you never know. Let's see. One. And again, kind of going back to what Michael was saying about terminology, nowhere are we using the phrase percent here because we wanted to kind of just keep this as simple as possible. But we did see some people coming back to us saying, how can you be so disclosive? <laughs> <laughs> I know who that person is. <laughs> so, um, and then will complete this. What about people who are educated? So this is for every 100 adults, how many of them have got a degree level qualification or above? Come on, somebody shout out an answer. 28, okay. And I guess what we're seeing here is people at the university who, or, or near the university, have some connections. That's pushing that up. That's quite a high figure. And how many households do not have a car or van? 70. <laughs> the American perspective of what England is like is... <laughs> is sensational, okay, we, I've got a feeling we may be waiting for coffee a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for this. <coughs> Where is that gonna stop? There we go, 24. So, and then at the end of the quiz, we give ourselves a score, and I'm afraid our overall rating is not good, uh, folks. So it's, uh, <laughs> oh dear, have you been to this area before? Well, actually, probably not for a lot of you, <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, but what we get now are the options like, I'm going to share that score on Twitter. <laughs> That's that visual, personal, social thing. Um, I'm going to play it again for another area, which seemed to be quite popular. Um, but also, as a link in to now say, I want to see some more detailed statistics for this area. And that takes you into a direct link into the statistics site for that area. Now, this was really little much more than an experiment. I was just interested to see how this would go down. Turns out <laughs> um, that, I mean, 
England did not have the best World Cup. But even I was surprised that Steve Gerrard had to <laughs> was relegated under the quiz on the front page of the newspapers when, when we launched this. And we'd had a pretty bad cricket season as well. So like, these guys got pushed down. And a quiz based on three-year-old data um, found its way onto the top of the Guardian's website. And just to kind of mirror what we found out with the New York Times, we launched the quiz on July the 21st. By July the 25th, we'd had a quarter of a million people do the quiz. Uh, and it was by far and away the most popular content item on the statistics website for the whole year by that point. Um, but even more interesting was what people started to say about this as they discussed it out on, on Twitter. Firstly, people were saying really nice things. And for a statistics office, that is a really unusual but pleasant <laughs> experience. <laughs> because in a statistics office, people very rarely say, thanks for that number. It was a really great number you provided <laughs> for us last week. You know, there, there was clearly stuff going on here where people were kind of saying, you know, we're really pleased, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we want to do. But then, it, it, as I drilled down more into it, it was really interesting. People starting to feel guilty if they found data being thumbed. So this, this company said, this is a welcome distraction on a Monday afternoon. And that was followed up by another company saying it was a nice Friday afternoon distraction. So we've got either end of the week, people saying it's a distraction. Not that we'd ever condone playing online games in the office, but this quiz has been keeping us busy. Best new procrastination tool. I like that. Like, <laughs> is it procrastination to find out a little bit about the area you live? I don't know. If you're looking for a distraction, this is interesting. Too addictive. And then this is great. These were people who were tweeting. I'm sure they were tweeting in case their boss was watching their tweets to say, I was doing it at lunchtime. <laughs> It's a lunchtime crossword alternative, uh, right? I'm do still doing my real job. And then, and then actually somebody took it to tea break. Uh, it's like a tea break engagement. But then this is, this is the bit that I really liked a lot, is that people were finding this experience a source of genuine insights and revelations. The people who um, were suffering the indignity of the longer animations were saying, you know, it's a good starting point for discussions about the neighborhood. We originally thought that the quiz would be great for schools, that teachers trying to get kids interested in statistics might like to use it as an entry point for why statistics are interesting and useful. What we didn't anticipate was politicians <laughs> challenging each other to uh, how well do you know the area you claim to represent. And this is... Joe Dromey, who's the son of a fairly uh, high-profile politician in the country, he, and he challenged all of the fellow councillors in his part of London to do the, the quiz and to kind of share scores. Um, having fun with our misconceptions, and that was really nice, the idea that people thought it was quite nice to be spending time highlighting that kind of gap. Uh, incredibly out on the Muslim percentage question, the actual answer is zero. <laughs> so I don't know what the real answer, the, the submitted answer was. Um, fascinating for no less for exactly how ill-educated we are about the Muslim population. So this was really nice to see coming through, that people were going through the quiz um, and, and finding out a bit more. There's been quite a few surprises for people in terms of how they perceive the area, which is exactly what we were kind of trying to achieve. So the other thing, and this is the final kind of uh, part of this talk, was I hope you kind of see the link between the earlier work where we were becoming comfortable and confident with some coding techniques to enter that visual world, and then having acquired some of those techniques, not to the Jason Davis level, but enough to, uh, for us to be able to, to build stuff, that we were able to push our data and our work in directions that would otherwise have remained closed off. And the final thing, taking it back to some of the real interesting gamification, is we didn't capture the quarter of a million uh, scores from users because we simply lack the infrastructure to do that on the, on the ONS website. But what we did do was, you know, there was the option to share scores on Twitter. Uh, and so what we were really surprised about is uh, using the, the hashtag we'd come up with that so many people decided to 
to share their user-generated scores um, for their area. So they were sharing the geography and the score, and we got thousands of people sharing those scores. The, 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 kind of the, the thing that really fascinates me about where that kind of might take us is that it might be a really cool source of data for us in the future that we've never really considered in the past, that we can kind of tap into perceptions as much as we can to kind of statistical uh, convention um, in terms of data collection. Great, okay, so that's uh, all I wanted to show you and I'm very happy to take a few questions. Yeah. So some of the comments there say that they're, um, they, 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 they realized that they were ill-educated about, about their area, as if, I don't know, they should have been taught about it at school. Is there, any, is there any idea or any evidence that by doing this quiz or by interacting like this, they know more about it after they've finished than, or I can retain that than before they took it? Or is it just a, gee, just see how long you work? I, it's a really interesting question. I think what we wanted to do was two things. We were certainly interested in whether this particular content type would capture enough users for us to be able to have an understanding of that and also then to see what people were saying about how before and after they were feeling. Against that, it's only seven questions. Again, you know, picking off some fairly high level census topics. So there's a limit to how like enlightened people are really gonna be. One of the interesting things though was that the, one of the options at the end of the quiz was to go get a more detailed statistical summary for your area, right? And I went to talk to the guys because it actually brought down the ONS website for a an hour or two uh, when it was up because it, uh, you know, the server administrators weren't kind of happy with me. Um, but I did talk to the guys and said, how many profiles have you generated? And the answer was three months worth in two days. They got something like another five and a half thousand user profiles generated in like a 48 hour period. And so that seemed to me to be people who were sufficiently interested in what the quiz had told them to then go on and say, actually, I want to learn more about the area. So difficult to say for sure, but um, I think it, for some people, certainly, it, it kind of captured. So it's a very nice gateway into, in, for some people to drill down into the, into the data further. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there an API behind that that would allow others, you talk about schools, but, but could others build similar tools using your data, or would they have to start from... from uh, that was actually the, when I say it was an experiment, one of the things we said was we wanted to use it to, I think on the quiz, we provide direct links to the API service so you can go to the developer portal to find that out. Um, there is an issue in not, not all of our data is available through that API. It's essentially just a, a fairly flat census API, but it's relatively small area, so you can drill into, you know, to do that sort of thing using the API. Um, and we tried to comment the code that we've generated so that people could pick that quiz up and kind of pick it apart to see how it worked and, and, and kind of play with it. Has anyone actually done that? Well, I mean, we only launched it in July 21st, so I, I, <laughs> I know you can teach yourself SVG in 24 hours, but, um, <laughs> um, but I definitely, that's exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to show to people this is a fairly rich source of data unleash your imagination on it and, and do all sorts of stuff. There are things that we've been thinking about where it'd be lovely to people come in and do that job for us. You know, one of the first thoughts for a quiz I had was we could do an app that was how normal am I? But I thought it would be quite odd for the government to be telling people how normal they are. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so there might be kind of editorial lines that might make it easier for other people to exploit the APR rather than us. Um, so sure, absolutely, that was the, the kind of point behind it, really. So, so I'm wondering about uh, something you said and also in the previous presentation about not using the term percent or not talking about, you know, terms that are, I guess, that are considered hard for anybody who doesn't have uh, at least the, so basically my question is this, and I, I get frustrated sometimes with these things because I understand that you're trying to, to aim low so that a lot of people will be able to do these things and understand what you're talking about, but I wonder, I mean, or are, are you wondering if you actually miss some of the people who might want to see a bit more, want to, might maybe see a regression, who maybe want to see percent, or maybe want to switch the view to something else and, and get a bit more information and see two or three things at the same time. And so you kind of have a way to go from, here's the simple view for everybody, and then yeah. here's the advanced view, or here's the, you know, the statistically more complicated, more in-depth 
I mean, it's, it's the eternal question, isn't it, about the audience and who you're designing for. And I think with the stats office, I mean, it's the same in other statistics offices as well. Increasingly, we've been challenged to capture a wider audience, okay? And so, um, content like this, we've designed for user personas who are not the expert users because they actually, a lot of them already have interfaces as core users that have built up over the years. Having said that, um, there should always be a gateway from these things for people to, to come in and do it. And one of the nice things was I actually tested the national statistician on this, <laughs> and he only got 43%. So it was <laughs> like, so, um, you know, th there were traditional stats users who found it really interesting to play with, but for them it's never going to be the primary access mechanism for the data, and we kind of have got to be aware of that. Um, the thing about the numeracy and the kind of dropping the terminology is really interesting for me because um, for me, a lot of the time, the statistical dressing that we put around our products acts as a barrier to engagement with data that people are perfectly capable of understanding. Um, my favorite example of that is the, there was a lotto scratch card a few years ago in the UK that was on sale for 48 hours before they had to pull it because it asked people to compare negative numbers it was like a temperature, a kind of winter temperature scratch card thing. Um, and the pe so people were being asked directly, uh, is minus seven higher or lower than minus two? And they couldn't get it. But if you'd asked them, is minus seven colder than minus two, they would have all got it. You know, there, there was lots of evidence that they'd just framed it wrong by kind of presenting it in just the wrong way. So. Absolutely. Uh, it's not going to satisfy everybody, but um, I think the people who have been least well served by statistics agencies in the past are the general audience rather than the expert audience. Okay. Thanks very much. Coffee.